number 10, we're going to begin reading at the 19th verse. And we're going to read down through the 20, um, third verse. And we'll see what God has to say. What shall I say then? Verse 19 is a continuation of a conversation that Paul started in chapter 8. What shall I say then? The idol is anything, King James says. That is, the idol is nothing. Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. That's nothing or of some value. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Please silence your cell phones. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? I say not. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful, but all things edify not. For your consideration, verse 21 says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. To the men of our great church and those who are watching today around this nation, I want to preach from this subject. God is calling for men who will drink from the Lord's cup and eat from the Lord's table only. God is calling for men who will drink from the Lord's cup and eat from the Lord's table only. Preach me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the word that the Lord gave me when in consultation with Director Golden as we spoke on this day. Serving the God of the Bible only is going to be our greatest challenge as we near the coming of the Lord. Jesus said this in Luke's gospel, chapter number 18, and the eighth verse, he said, speaking of the widow with the unjust judge, the Lord said, even though I will speedily avenge them, when I come, shall I find faith? On this earth. 
When I come back, will I find believers who are loyal to me plus nothing and plus no one? That's the challenge. The challenge is for us to stay pure. To stay true to the God of the Bible and to stay true to this book. As I hear some talk, we sometimes we behave as though this book is not enough. Although we, we talk as though it's not sufficient. That it needs other disciplines, other doctrines. Of the gods to help it. Genesis chapter number 17 and verse 1 God revealed himself to Abraham as God Almighty, El Shaddai, El God Shaddai, all sufficient. El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God, or the God who is more than enough. We used to believe, not that he was enough, but that he was more than enough. We used to believe that he did, it didn't take all of the Holy Ghost to fill us. You'd be filled, but there's enough of him to go around to everyone. But over time, our language has changed. Because society it seems to be growing more wicked. It seems to me, and I'm going to preach to you, that our faith in this has been shaken. At times the Bible is referred to as a mere book when it is more than a book. It's the word of God. It's God's love letter to us and it's perfect. It's perfect. It rejoices the soul. It's perfect. It enlightens the eyes. Oh my. It will bless and keep us through the storms of life. The Bible says in Psalms 19 and verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It is complete. Converting, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It's firm, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. They're just. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they. God's word is to be desired more than gold. Yea, than fine gold. And I still believe this. It's sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. And make no mistake about it, moreover by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them there is great reward there is great reward in obeying the bible is the bible still sweeter to you than the honey and the honeycomb do you still believe that he is the god who is more than enough do you not know 
that uh, that was the issue with Joshua when he gave his farewell speech. The issue was not simply serving the Lord, but the issue was serving the Lord only. Because as they moved into Canaan, they moved into a land that had at least seven nations. All of those nations had different gods. All of those nations had traditions that had nothing to do with Yahweh. They were wicked. They were evil. They offered child sacrifice. They were filled with all kinds of perversions and immorality. Violence was in those nations. The nations were so wicked that God took the land from them and gave that land to Israel. By the way, it's the contested land even today. God gave that land to Israel. God promised Abraham 400 years or more before they took possession of it. God said, I'm going to bring you back to this place and you're going to go into bondage 400 years, but I'm going to bring you out and bring you back to this land. He said, but I'm not going to do it right now because the sins of the Amorites are not yet full. But when they've gotten as wicked as I can take, I'm going to give the land to you. That should say something to all of us. One of the keys to keeping what you have is living holy. The Bible teaches that righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Satan would love to rob us of our ministries, of our future, of our home. It don't take but one sin, one bad decision, one uh, 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 misbehavior, and you can lose it all. I want to encourage the mighty men of this church to live for God. Let's walk up right. And let's be who and what the Lord would have us to be. Joshua said this. He says, now therefore, in Joshua 24 and verse 14, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Serve him. That is sincerity. Serve God only. And in truth, be faithful to him. Notice this. He said, and put away, that means they were there, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood while your fathers were in Egypt, while your fathers were in the wilderness, while they were traveling, they picked up other gods. They picked up customs that I was not pleased with. He said, put them away, put them away. Put away the, uh, the put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve the Lord. That is, and serve Yahweh only. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord only, then choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, yes, that were on the other side of the flood, the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. Why would you serve their gods? I've dispossessed them. I've conquered their gods. I've given you their land. Why would you serve those gods? But I heard Joshua say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord only. We are going to serve him only. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And which did those great signs in our sights and preserved us in all the way wherein we went. And among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from us, from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore. We will serve the Lord for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, bear with me, saints, you cannot serve the Lord. Not the way you want to serve him. 
for he is a holy God. I got a question for you, church of God in Christ, my great church, men's ministry. Do we still believe that the God of the Bible is a holy God? And do we still believe that that holy God is still calling for holiness? Not just holiness in singing. Not just holiness in dancing. Not mere holiness in form. But holiness in lifestyle. Holiness in the way we carry ourselves. Holiness in the way we treat our wives and our families. Holiness in the way we treat each other. Holiness in the way we handle money. Holiness in the way we stand for what is right. Holiness in our ability to be separate from the world. See, we're, we're mingling too much. We're finding ways to do what Jesus said a man can't do. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. But we're trying to figure that out. We're trying to walk together with folk that we're not agreed with. What's going on in the modern day holiness church? We're talking one language, but in reality, we're living another. And God is looking for men tonight. God is looking for men today who will say, Lord, I'll give you my all and I'll give it to you only. For you are holy. Not only is he holy, but let me warn you, he's a jealous God. And he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, he has done you good from your beautiful home, from your nice car, from your powerful positions, from all of the blessings that you walk in. Never forget, the Lord gave it to you. Never forget, we enjoy these things because God's been good to us. But I, I read what Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. None of us are in a position, in positions of security like we think we are. We got to serve him and live holy. And if we do it, he will bless us. He's looking for men who will serve him only. Are you praying with me? I said that our text was the continuation of an argument that our Lord, that Paul had started earlier. Paul was answering the questions that the saints at Corinth had asked him. The question was, they wanted to know, how do we deal with, how do we handle Christians eating food that have been sacrificed to idols? How do we deal with believers bringing into the Corinthian church, that which has not been sanctified and sanctioned by the God of the Bible. Now, I didn't write the Bible. I didn't write the Bible. There's no book in the Bible called the Book of Wooden. Maybe we just read it and preach it, study the context of it, and preach it in context. And you can't blame me for the context or what the author meant when he wrote it. I'm a strong believer that the Bible can never say what it never said. And it can never mean what it never meant. It is not ours to assign meaning to the text. We're to read it, extrapolate from it what's being said, and tell you then you can either receive it or not. But the apostle says, now touching things, men offered unto idols, concerning food 
or anything that have been offered to a false god. He says, we know that we all have knowledge. We're all smart to some degree. But he warned the saints at Corinth. He says, but knowledge makes you arrogant. King James says, knowledge puffeteth up. You know, some of us, our goal is to be the smartest in the crowd. But I heard him say, but charity edify. Knowledge will make you arrogant. But those who are operating in God's love seeks to edify and spread the truth to each other. He says, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought to know. That is, all of our knowledge, every one of us is limited. Only God knows everything to the degree that it should be known. He doesn't have a counselor. The God of the Bible has no school teacher. Romans chapter number 11 asks, well, who is the Lord's counselor? Who taught him? The answer is nobody. He's the fount of all information. And so he says, but if any man, listen to this, love God, the same is known of him. Praise the Lord. God knows who love him. Many of us know him, but I wonder, wonder how, much, how many of us love him. Many of us can quote scripture, but God wants us to love him. He loves us. Can I get a witness? So Paul says, after laying this foundation, he says, and concerning the uh, things that you wrote, concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, he says, but let me, let me lay this down. We know that an idol is nothing. We know that these false gods are nothing but statues in the world and that there is none other God but one. The saints know this. You know, the, the uh, United Nations tried to form a group called the United Religions. This was back in the 80s, and they were going to put Mikhail Gorbachev over it. But Christianity messed the thing up. They couldn't get the united religions together because there's a pesky passage of scripture in the Bible that undermined the whole thing. They were trying to get all the religions to work together. Get all the religions to join together in a common cause. All of the religions equally accept each other as true. But Christianity messed the thing up. Jesus had to go on and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, no man cometh to the Father but by me. That pesky scripture messed the whole thing up and it failed because Jesus dismissed all other paths to God. What do you think he was talking about in John 10 when he said, uh, uh, all who came before me, that is all who came before me claiming to be messiahs, claiming to know the way. He said they are thieves and robbers. Then he said down in verse 10, and the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I don't care if it's an Islamic thief, a Buddhist thief, doesn't matter who, who and what it is. If it is not Jesus, if it's not the God of the Bible, it's designed to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. How many, believe, how many still believe that Jesus is the only way? Oh, I'm going to preach in just a moment, but let me tell you, in the city of Corinth, there was at least 16 temples to false gods. Oh, Aphrodite, and all of them was there, Hermes, and all Zeus, and all of the gods. The temples were huge, and people were worshiping those gods. And they had altars in there. 
in those temples. And here's how it went. When you offered something to God, to these false gods, one third of the sacrifice was consumed to the God. Another third of the sacrifice was given to the offerer. And the remaining third was given to the priest. Now, people were offering sacrifices all the time. So the part that was consumed was gone. The part that was given to the offerer, he took it or she took it home with them. But the priests of those false gods, once they had all the food that they could uh, gather, that food, the remainder, made its way to what was called the meat markets. And each temple to a false god had a cafeteria in that temple where the meat was cooked and prepared and uh, people went to the cafeteria and sat in there and ate. So the Corinthians, everybody in the church at Corinth, remember Corinth was a Gentile city. Remember, Paul heard uh, someone in the night, uh, an angel in the night saying, uh, come over uh, to Macedonia and help us. And in that, in that travels, he preached out the church at Corinth. And God said, no one is going to be able to sit on you and to hurt you because I have much people in this city. But everybody in that congregation had ate at those temples, had sacrificed to those gods. And they got saved. They got saved. Corinth was an immoral city. It was so immoral that a man had his father's wife. And, and they were in the church. Had her. He married her. In the church with his mother-in-law. Stepmother, excuse me. In the church. And the church was so liberal and so tolerant and they bragged on their tolerance they boasted oh because Paul said you were puffed up they boasted on their ability to have this going on and nobody be corrected nobody be checked nobody be taken down oh we're like that look at the stuff we're tolerating now in the church and we pretend not to notice Paul said you should be mourning that the people who have done this uh, be taken away from you. Yeah. And so he had to judge that situation. Corinth was so immoral that when the women and the men got married because they were so sexually immoral uh, that they didn't want to have sex with each other after they got married. Because it reminded them of their immorality in the world. First Corinthians chapter number 7. And Paul wrote to them and said, no, 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 no. You're married now. You're married now. You, you can do it now. Praise the Lord. Don't, 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 don't defraud one another. Go on and love each other. It's, it's all right now. They said, but, but it reminds me of my previous life. They said, he said, yeah, but that was then. But this is now. One of the things, pastors and men, uh, that you see was necessary was atmosphere. See, we got to, I'm talking to the pastors now, we've got to make sure that we foster an atmosphere in our church that is conducive for deliverance. Case in point, if the young man has gotten saved and he's come to your church, Young man's life, he's been out there in perversion. He's been with men, he's been abused, but he don't want to live like that. And he has come in, praise God. And he's trying to live holy. He's trying to live right. The last thing he needs to see is veteran men in the church who've been saved a long time still acting like sissies, still effeminate, still acting like girls after you've been saved 20 years in the church. The question is, how long does it take God to deliver? 
Think about it. How is he going to make it if the deacon acts like a, I like to say a fact, if the deacon acts like a homosexual? How is he going to make it if the pastor behaves that way? He's gotten delivered. He's trying to make it. But what he sees, he, you know, before he got saved, he had a pot, he had a, he cussed a lot. And now he's saved, but the preacher cussed. Every one of us are responsible for fostering an atmosphere of deliverance where people can say, such were some of you, but now you are washed. Now you are justified. Now you are sanctified. Our church is the greatest church in the world, but we can stand a little polishing. I want you to know, and I... And, uh, and working in this, in this position, uh, Bishop Gold and I, we're working hard. And, but uh, I want you to know that the, the criticism of our church uh, for some of all of these uh, uh, perverts that attend our national conferences, the criticism is not their presence. I'm glad they come. The criticism is that many times those who can say something, Say nothing. And when it comes to preaching, indifference is an endorsement. When it comes to preaching, when we fail to speak up, then people think that we agree with it. We want everybody in church, but we want people to see and hear that the Lord is a deliverer. That he can set you free. And a man walk up to you and say to that young Christian, I had the same struggles but he delivered me. They had a problem in Corinth, in the cafeteria where food was being served that was dedicated uh, to Aphrodite, a temple that had a thousand prostitutes. Yes, sir. The problem was that the saints had began to partake. Are y'all praying for me? Just give me just a few more minutes and we're going home. Paul said, now we know that those idols of nothing, uh, though there be many that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, praise the Lord, and as there be gods many, and lords many, but to us, to the church of God in Christ, to us, to the saints of God, there is but one God, and Father, uh, and of a Father of whom are all things, and we in him, we are for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we are by him. How be it, even though we know there's only one God, even though we know that the gods in those temples aren't gods at all, even though we know that, that they're not real, every man doesn't have this knowledge, Praise the Lord for some with conscience of the idol uh, unto this hour. Eat as eat it as a thing offered unto idols. What is he saying? Many used to eat at those tables. And when they see us doing this, it reminds them of when they were in it. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 15, had they been mindful of the country that they left, they would have went back to it. Let's be careful that our churches not remind people of the clubs that they just got delivered from. Let's be careful that our praise and worship don't mimic dancing like the world and reminding them of the deliverance they've come out of. We are not called to reflect the world. We're not called to try to be like them. God didn't call the preacher to be a glorified Dr. Phil. God didn't call us to try to look like rock stars and hip hop stars. We're preaching with cut out jeans and the necktie is gone. And oh my God, we look like we're on our way to the ball game. We're not supposed to remind people of what they came out of. We're called to remind them of where they're headed. My God. We're on our way to see a holy God. Oh! So 
somebody shout, I know that's right. We, we got to show the world that there is a reality in serving God. And when that man looked up and saw, praise the Lord, those who were born again sitting there eating that meat. Paul does say meat commendeth us not to God, neither for neither if we eat are we better. And if we don't eat, we're, not, we're, no, we're no worse off. He said, but take heed lest by any means. Now this is where love comes in. And take heed lest by any means. Oh God, that your freedom, that your liberty, this liberty of yours doesn't become a stumbling block to those that are weak. Maybe it doesn't bother you. Maybe you don't have a problem with it. But what if it trips up your brother? Maybe, maybe whomever you pledge to, it doesn't bother you to display it at the convocation. But where's your love and concern for those to whom it does bother? Since that display doesn't appertain to a convocation. A convocation is a holy convocation where we're called here to serve the Lord. We're not called here to do that. You can't just take the position I don't care. You can't look at your brothers and sisters and say, you need to get a life. No, no. There are many things that, that, that you know as a, as a mature believer that you know you could do, but you're not going to do it in front of some babe in Christ because they might get confused. I'm not getting an amen now. I'm almost done. I'm going to holler and I'm going home. Paul said, my God, he said, not everybody understand this. He said, and through thy knowledge, you may know it, but through your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Christ cares for that weak brother. If you just going to be a mason, you ought not to be in the pulpit flashing signs. For, for that doesn't appertain to the pulpit. And that thing will affect your brother. We say we love each other, but do we? I don't care what I don't care what he said. I don't care what he thinks. I like it, and I'm going to do it. And it don't bother me. That's not a Christian attitude. Paul says, "But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ." So the next time we get ready to tell each other to get a life, the next time we get ready to tell each other, I don't care how you feel about it. Remember, that person that you're discounting is for whom Christ died. And you may not care about him. May not matter to you, but it matters to Jesus. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves the weak. And Jesus loves the strong. Wherefore, here's the right attitude. If meat maketh my brother, if meat uh -huh, maketh my brother to offend, I will eat no meat, I'll eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother offended. That is, lest I lead my brother astray. Oh Lord, there are things that you can do in the privacy of your bedroom with your wife. Brethren, that's not fit for public consumption. Oh, Lord. That's why you don't do it in public. Because it can send the wrong message. Mm, we've got to be concerned about one another's welfare. Oh, Lord. Got to love each other enough to say, well, if this uh, is going to trip someone up, 
then I'm not going to do it. Paul said, what shall we say then? Good God Almighty, the idol is nothing. The idol, the, see when you sacrifice to idols, you this is a meaningless act of a positive evil because it gives something that was made that was man made the same devotion that belongs to God. You can say what you wanna, but we we've, we've pledged ourselves, we've affixed ourselves to things that behave like quasi religions. Many of these things. Ah, they behave like religions. What do you mean when you die? They have a space in your funeral. When you die, they speak over your body. That's the domain of a religion. That's why when you get saved, you got to come out. When I got saved, they told me I had to come out. There were things that I was in. I was just like Bishop Patterson. The sin hadn't gotten that miserable. I was out there. But when I got saved, they told me that I had to come out. And when I went to Federal State University, oh Lord, one of them, good God Almighty, tried to recruit me. I told them I'm already in something. They said, what are you in? I said, the church of God in Christ. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and I've been running for Jesus ever since. What am I saying? We've got to be careful as we bring the world in. Because the Bible teaches that evil men were creeping unawares, bringing in damnable heresies. The Bible doesn't hold the place that it used to hold. Every one of us got to go back and take a look at this book because he is, he's coming again. He's coming and it won't be long. If you notice in my whole sermon throughout my entirety, I've asked you to say nothing to your neighbor, but I want to indulge you and ask you to grab your neighbor by the hand, oh Lord, and say, neighbor, use your preaching voice, oh neighbor, oh Lord, I want to tell you one thing. I know that you're big and you're bad. I know, oh Lord, that you got a chain around your neck. Ooh, Lord, I know that you got all the money in your pocket. You can preach like Paul. You can cast out devils like Jesus did. But ah, neighbor, that's one thing you can't do. You can't serve God and the devil. You can't drink from the Lord's cup and eat from the devil's table and eat from the Lord's table. The Lord is calling us to holiness. The Lord is looking for a man who will say to God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll live what you want me to live. I'll take the criticism. I'll take the lies. I'll be talked about, but I'm going to serve you and no one else. I'm going to lift my soul to you and to you only. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I'll be that man. Lord, I'm going all the way, all the way, all the way. Somebody praise him right now. Praise him right now. Who will be that man? Who will be that 
that woman to say, I'll sell out. I'll sell out. I'll sell out to the God who's more than enough. I'll sell out to the God who's still a healer. He's still a deliverer. He's still a way maker. Can I see you? Wave your hands. If you tell God, I'll go. If I have to go by myself, I'll go. If I never get back to Memphis, I'll go. If they stop talking to me, I'll go. They may drop me from that text thread, but it's all right as long as I got King Jesus, as long as I'm living holy, as long as the Lord is on my side, I'll be all right. Somebody say yeah. Somebody say yes. Someone praising. Someone magnifying. Let me hear the men. Let me hear the men. Let them hear you on television. Let them hear you as they stream saying loud. Go, yeah, yeah. If you're God's man, if you're God's man, if you're God's woman, if you're go, meet me on the altar. If you say to the Lord, Here am I, send me, here am I, send me. I'll stand up and tell the world that there's a reality in serving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If there's a man here that says, Lord, if I have to go by myself, I'm going with Jesus. Come on down the aisle, make your way may be crowded just for a minute. I want to pray. I want to pray. We're going to rededicate ourselves to God. Yes, Lord. We're going to walk. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to preach. We're going to stand. Stand for the unborn. Stand for holiness, stand against racism, stand against wickedness, stand against false doctrine, stand, 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 yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I would that the musicians just hold it for a minute and let us, let the men, let the praises and the worship just go up. Can we do it without music? Can we do it? Oh God, oh God. Here we are Lord, here we are Lord, here we are Lord. We pledge to you and you only. We believe that biblical Christianity is complete as it is. We believe that holiness is right, it's sufficient. We believe, come on men. Just for 10 seconds more, worship him. And somebody can say today, not only do I believe, but I'm a living witness.
Let the rebels. Hey! 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 Oh. Oh. I'm going to serve you only. 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 Only you. My time is up. We have other things that we must do. But I heard him say it like this in the old church. You know how they told the Lord they're going to serve him only? They said, I belong to God oh, I belong to God oh, I belong to God my whole body belongs to God. my hands belong to God. my hands my hands belong to God Listen, my feet, my feet, man. Oh, my whole good God on my the last one. Whoa, oh, everybody. My whole body belong My whole body be oh, oh, yeah. Let's receive the mighty director of the men's ministry, Director Michael.